Hi, everybody. Welcome into Sports Talk Chicago. So great to have all of you here with us. We are back and we're ready for tons of Bears, Bulls, Cubs, and White Sox talk here tonight. It's going to be a very fun and a variety type show. And we're glad to be here with you. My name is John Zaglul. John Meadows is directing and producing. Want to give a big shout out and hello to all of our great TV and radio affiliates across Illinois and Indiana. WROK, our newest one in Rockford, 101.1 Peoria Sports Radio, 98.3 The Life, WKAN, 105.5 The Ticket, ACTV, Gen TV, WJOB, and Cities 92.9 Talk App. And if you want to be a part of the conversation, you can comment and subscribe on YouTube at Sports Talk Chicago. Also, follow us all over on social at Sports Talk Chicago as well. First two segments of today's program are going to be with my good friend here on today's show. He's covered Chicago sports for 40-plus years. He is the author of Tell Me a Story I Don't Know and the former podcast host Tell me a, of, of the podcast Tell Me a Story I Don't Know. Please welcome George Hoffman to the program. George, it's always great to have you on. How are you? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for uh, having me on. I really appreciate it. Of course, thank you for being here. We have so much to discuss, so I'm happy you're going to be here with us for two segments. It seems like there are things going on with every team in Chicagoland, and you know, coming to you for a lot of this uh, information and your expertise covering all these teams over the past 40 years. I did want to start with the Bears. What was your reaction to the Justin Fields trade? was bound to happen it just took so long that uh you know it, it was there was a time where i was considering getting fitted for a straight check and they just didn't have my size it was just <laughs> unbelievable right the thing was stringing along and what was most interesting about all of it look at the amount of quarterbacks that changed teams i think it's historic i don't think there's ever been that much rollover of quarterbacks different teams and you were getting the second string guys and third string guys and here's justin fields he's still with the bears but eventually, they sent him to a team he wanted to be at, and they only got a sixth-round pick. But the bottom line is he couldn't stay. There was no way that that was going to happen. So now that that's out of the way, then you get to the Caleb Williams talk and more Caleb Williams, and it seems like a fait accompli that uh, in, what, three-plus weeks from now, he will be the Bears' new quarterback. I guess he was in town for dinner last night and had a meeting with the Bears today. Did you think it was the right move from the Bears front office perspective to move on from Justin Fields and hopefully draft Caleb Williams? Oh, absolutely. I don't think there was any doubt that that's exactly what they were going to do. Uh, you know, he has limitations. Justin Fields is a wonderful athlete. He's in a very exciting type of quarterback, but he's really not a very accurate thrower. And they were looking for that kind of guy. And they believe that Caleb Williams is that guy. And the consensus among the experts in, you know, college football and pro football is that he is the best out there, albeit there are others who are pushing the door. And one of those is J.J. McCarthy, who I really believe is going to wind up being a terrific quarterback for whomever he is going to play for. But I think it's pretty obvious that it's going to be Caleb Williams. How much of a game changer do you think he's going to be? I mean, with all of this hype surrounding him, you'd have to think that year one he's going to make a big step or a big impact in the NFL. Well, there's two things about that. I did a, a little research a while back to look at the quarterbacks taken in the first round of the NFL draft. There were 69 of them taken in the first round of the draft. And, so, and this is not just the first pick, but just 69 in the first round. So I looked at numbers and determined how many of them were either very good or great in their first year. And that total was just 13 or 19%. Two of them included Jameis Winston, who's still in the league and still probably going to be throwing interceptions for whomever he signed with, because I know he moved teams. Um, RJ3 was another guy who mm -hmm. uh, I, I saw on that list. He had a great first year. So... It's not, it's not a fait accompli that he is going to just step in there like C.J. Stroud did last year, kind of the anomaly, having a spectacular year for, for Houston. But Williams is also stepping into a very rare situation. He's not stepping into a team that won two games or three games. He's stepping into a team that won seven, where the arrow is pointing up, where they just added another top-flight receiver, and so when it comes to this draft, I think that they really have to be very careful with whatever they do with the ninth pick, whether they trade it, whether they keep it, but they really still have to build in the trenches. And you want to make sure that you protect this quarterback. 
but he's coming into a very comfortable situation. But for them to be a, say, 10-win team in a division that has the Detroit Lions, who are a Super Bowl contender, and possibly the same thing with the Green Bay Packers, and who knows if the Minnesota Vikings pick a quarterback, this is might be the best division in football suddenly. So, uh, but, but the bottom line is uh, Ryan Poles has done a really, really good job now building this team. So it's going to be interesting to see now what he does besides Caleb Williams, because I guess they only have, what, three picks after that. And one of them, of course, is the ninth pick for now. George Offman here with us on Sports Talk Chicago, 40-plus year sports media veteran and the author of Tell Me a Story I Don't Know. George, in terms of Caleb Williams, I read last week on Twitter that this is going to be the first time, if the Bears choose him, which they should, that a rookie quarterback will be starting off his career with two receivers who topped 1,200 yards on the yeah. same team the year before. Yeah. So you talk about ready-made situations. That's certainly something to be considered. Oh, without a doubt. And on top of that, if they decide to go for another wide receiver with the ninth pick, which is possible, though, there are some really good receivers in this draft lower. I would really think that they might be better off either getting another pass rusher or somebody to, to be on that offensive line to help Williams. Yes, he is stepping into a very unique situation, which is why a lot of people say, well, why didn't you keep Justin Fields? The problem is he's just not a very accurate passer. Williams is. And so I think that... Um, Listen, the onus is going to be on him anyhow, and it's going to be a lot of pressure on him to be really good. Uh, if he's average, average in the first year, that might be good enough for them to win 10 games. If he's great, who knows? Uh, he may make mistakes. Like I said, it, it, there's a paucity of quarterbacks who've been very successful, uh, first-round picks that have been really good in their first year. But he's got all the moxie. Uh, he's got a lot of talent. He's a little smallish at 6'1", but we'll see. Uh, obviously, if so many people believe he's the consensus number one, and I believe the Bears think he's the number one quarterback, uh, it, it, it's, maybe it's finally time for the Bears to find that, that elusive, and we are talking about very elusive, franchise quarterback. What do you think the expectation should be for him, realistically speaking? Because I've seen Bears fans – say, well, we got rid of Justin Fields, so that means we need to see a 4,000-yard season and a superstar year from Caleb Williams in his rookie year. I think we have to remember he is still going to be a rookie, and there could be growing pains, which should be expected from somebody making that jump from college to the pros. Absolutely. Like I said, how many C.J. Strouds do you see in the league? That doesn't happen very often. Patrick Mahomes sat. I don't think anybody knew Patrick Mahomes was going to be what he was. They knew they was going to be good, but not this good. There was no way in the world they did. And sometimes there are quarterbacks that are chosen that nobody thinks are going to be good, like Mr. Irrelevant last year, who wound up taking the San Francisco 49ers to a Super Bowl. That's a rarity, to say the least. So, I mean, the expectations are going to be very high. The pressure on him, particularly from the fandom, is going to be very high. So I can't sit here and tell you numbers John, I can't sit here and say, look, he's not going to rush for a thousand yards. Okay. He's not going to do that. He's actually, as he said, he's, he doesn't like running. He runs when he has to. He's a passer. I think that's what the bears are most interested in. If he needs to run, he's proven that he can run, but yes, he's going to have at least two very good wide receivers to throw to. And what's most important is that he has the time to throw to them uh, part of the reason that Justin Fields got sacked so often, and people sometimes say they, they malign the, the, the Bears' offensive line, but part of the reason that he was sacked so often is he held on to the ball so long. I believe last year, again, he was last in holding the ball 3.7 seconds or something. That's going to get you sacked. No matter what you can do, that's going to get you sacked. So in this case, and Williams, by the way, also tends to hold the ball long. So he's going to have to learn quickly. And I listen, it's going to be very competitive. Uh, I think the Bears have the, 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 what, they have the last place schedule, but they're playing, I think it's the AFC South, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you've got the Lions and the Packers, and they're both really, really good teams. It's going to be very, very competitive for him. What's your expectation for this Bears team in 2024? Are you 
at minimum expecting 10 wins, a playoff appearance, anything more? But what are you thinking? Well, first of all, I want to see what they do in the draft and whether or not they pick up some other players. But certainly they're going to be, they were on an up. And you could see with Matt Eberflus as the defensive coordinator, which he is still basically going to be, and adding Sweat last year was, I mean, adding him was a tremendous boon. They need another player like him. So it all depends on what they do. I mean, there could be expectations of winning 10 games. Could they be a playoff team? That's possible. Again, you're in a very, very competitive division. Uh, so I, I'm not going to put a number on them. I'm just going to say there's a good chance that they can win 10 games. I just want to see what they do in the draft. What's your take on the Bears stadium situation, too? I'd be oh, remiss if I didn't ask you on that. That's so stupid. Honest <laughs> did you see what the people did in Kansas City? They I voted, did. They voted, no, we're not going to spend tax money on refurbishing Arrowhead and, and building a new stadium for the Royals. Well, here the politics are very different. The very idea that the Bears are now not, they put almost Arlington Heights in the background, despite the fact that they spent how much money to, to tear down Arlington Park to make that their new home. And now what they want to do uh, to me, that's pie in the sky. Even if they are committing $2 billion to a building, they still will not own. The city of Chicago will own it. They're talking about tearing down Soldier Field, keeping the columns. This is the place, the spaceship that was built only 20 years ago. They're still paying it off. And now they want to tear that down and build a dome stadium downtown. I'm sorry. I just don't see how that's going to work. And as a taxpayer, I certainly wouldn't want to put a penny into that. Same thing with the White Sox. I think it's pie in the sky. But listen, if, if they can pull the wool over the, the mayor's eyes, that's one thing. I'm not so sure they're going to be able to do that with the governor. And I thought Arlington Heights was going to be the best situation for them. Yes. There, were people, there were people who were not happy that they wouldn't be in Chicago anymore, but it's accessible. You have 200 acres of land. You could build a whole experience, not just a stadium out there. I thought that would have been the best choice. John, they're only playing how many games? <laughs> right. They're playing either eight or nine home <laughs> games and a couple of preseason games. You're not the baseball team playing 81 <laughs> games. So you can go to Arlington Heights, which at least the infrastructure is better. Imagine what they have to do here. They not only have to change the infrastructure, they're talking about what is it, putting a bridge and putting uh, part of, was it Lakeshore Drive or Columbus Drive below ground or something? Come on, seriously. <laughs> I, I, it's utopian to me. To me, it's idiotic. And I, I, I've always said to contend they're going to still wind up in Arlington Heights. And until further notice, that's where I think they're going to eventually wind up. George Hoffman, author of Tell Me a Story I Don't Know, 40-plus year Chicago sports media veteran, is here with us on Sports Talk Chicago. I'm John Zaglul, John Meadows, here directing and producing. Going to continue to talk about the Bears here, George. So the stadium stuff, uh, we'll, we'll see how that ends up going, I guess. What's been your evaluation and take on Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus and their sort of partnership now as they enter another season together? Well, it started to come together last year, albeit it was a very strange year, which you know very well when oh, you reported yes. on the defensive coordinator and what happened to him. And then uh, you know, the offensive coordinator as well. But then suddenly, when they got Montez Sweat, the defense played so much better, um, and they started to win some games. And there were some really good moves made by Ryan Poles, uh, the best of which, of course, now is adding the wide receiver from the Chargers. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's basically saying we want to take a giant step forward with him, with Caleb Williams. And again, whatever they do with it, and they've got two picks in the top 10 of this draft. It's going to be very interesting whether or not he wants to trade down and get some more picks. Uh, it's a weak draft. It's a strong draft for quarterbacks, a strong draft for wide receivers. It was a fairly weak draft, as I've been reading. So I think he's done a, a, a good job. A lot of people don't like Matt Eberflus for what reason, I don't know. It takes time when you have a teardown of a franchise and then you have to move away from the quarterback that you had, but they certainly are primed to be a better team. Their arrow is pointing up. 
whereas the White Sox arrow is actually still pointing down, which is amazing for a team that won only 61 games last year. So uh, I'm impressed with, with some of the things that he's done, some of the draft picks from the last year. He's certainly upgraded the defense, but they definitely need another presence, uh, you know, on that defensive line, another pass rusher. Um, and I, and like, like I said, you build the trenches and you can protect Caleb Williams. So I, once again, I think this is still going to wind up being a very interesting draft, albeit with just at the moment, four picks. I would say too, that in terms of Ryan Poles, um, the only two misses that I could think of off the top of my head are Chase Claypool, obviously, absolutely, and maybe Bellis Jones Jr. But other than that, to his credit, I think he's been very shrewd and smart in the moves that he's made. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, Claypool was a, a giant mistake. You know? <laughs> uh, that's that's. But, but you know what? Uh, GMs will make mistakes, but if they can correct those mistakes, which clearly he's done, um, you know, DJ Moore turned out to be a terrific receiver, and now they have a dual threat. And if they decide to take one of the receivers, if they're available, no one knows if they're going to be available because you know that um, the recent acquisition is only going to be here for one year, likely. Uh, you know, so they've got the opportunity to do that. But yeah, no, I, 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 I'm looking forward to it because it looks finally like the Bears are moving in the right direction. Got George Hoffman here with us. We're going to take a break. He's going to come back with us. Cubs, White Sox, and Bulls. My goodness, we have all of that to discuss with George Hoffman. This is Sports Talk Chicago. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Sports Talk Chicago. Here for John Zaglul. Great to be back here with all of you. John Meadows directing and producing. We are on all of our great radio and TV affiliates across Illinois and Indiana. WROK 101.1 Peoria Sports Radio. 98.3 The Life. WKAN 105.5 The Ticket. ACTV, Jed TV, WJOB, and Cities 92.9 Talk FM. We appreciate all of our great friends on the SDC Syndication Network. You can follow us all over at Sports Talk Chicago. If you want to watch the program, subscribe on YouTube at Sports Talk Chicago. Give us a like there as well. If you miss any part of today's show, don't worry. We podcast it. Go to sportstalkchicago.com or any of your favorite podcasting platforms. You can listen segment by segment or listen to the whole thing in one swoop. Got a long car ride. You got things you need to take care of. Bring us with you. Listen to us in your car or on your smart speakers inside your homes. Our guest is back with us for another segment. He is the author of Tell Me a Story I Don't Know. He's a sports media veteran of 40-plus years. George Hoffman is here. We talked a lot of Bears in segment one, which is okay. We, we needed to get a lot of things out there on the table. But I want to start dedicating this second segment here, George, to baseball, Cubs, and White Sox. It's been a tale of two different teams to start off this season. Let's start with the White Sox. You mentioned them a couple of times in the last segment. I think it's been an utter disaster so far. What's your take on their situation? Well, I mean, let's take a look at what kind of talent they have before you could say it's an utter disaster. It was not a disaster <laughs> last year. It's n not expected to be a whole lot better, but it all depends on some of their pitchers that they brought. Garrett Crochet has just been absolutely yes. lights out. And usually when you see a guy who is a fastball pitcher, and he, he throws more than just the fastball, but he can really bring it uh, – a big strikeout guy like that's going to throw a lot of pitches. He hasn't. He hasn't done that in either start. I went about seven innings for both starts. Really? That's stunning in this day and age, especially for a guy who hasn't started a major league game. He's been great. Uh, you know, and, and the win that they had uh, last night against the Braves was, was encouraging. That was a, it was a wonderful game. I'm still not sold on Michael Kopeck. Sorry. I want to see more of that before I think – that this head case can actually be somebody good in the bullpen. But think about this for a minute. I mean, Eloy Jimenez is injured, which is really not a big surprise at all. How long he's going to be remains to be seen. It's day-to-day -day with him, but it's going to be day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week as you go along. <laughs> he's got an option next year. They're not going to pick it up. He's going to be gone. Um, Yohan Makata is making $24 million this year. He's got an option next year. He's going to be gone. So you're not going to be left with a whole lot. And Chris Getz, to his credit, is trying to put together what he can, cobble together a major league baseball team. And it's going to be even tougher after this season when he loses whatever bats he's going to lose. Uh, they're a better defensive team. Yes, that was a smart move to make. Who figured that Paul DeYoung would hit a home run to basically win uh, last night's game? 
But it's it's a team that's got such a long way to go. I mean, they're just in the beginning of a teardown again. The White Sox are going to be a team that's probably going to lose anywhere between 90, 95, and 100 games for at least the next three years. That, on top of the White Sox, also wanting a new facility. Why? I don't know. Because their ballpark is only 32-plus years old. I was there opening day, 1991. It's a really, really nice facility. But Jerry Reinsdorf said, hey, this is great. We don't pay a lot. You know, they basically barely pay any rent. But where did they build it? They built it in the same place where there's nothing to do afterwards and nothing to do beforehand. So what does he want? He wants a ballpark downtown, pretty much this, you know, that, in that uh, 78 lot uh, where they could build uh, shops and restaurants and bars and I wouldn't give him a penny. Now you've added Mike Clevenger. And I think David Haw said it right uh, on the score. They're tone deaf. The White Sox are tone deaf. They seem to make the same mistakes or different mistakes over and over and over again. And they have really, really angered, if not destroyed, a fan base. I mean, why would you want to be a fan of a club that keeps slapping you in the face the way the White Sox and Jerry Reisdorf have? So it's, it's not a great situation. Uh, I'm going to give Chris Getz time. I want to see how he puts this thing together. But let's understand, he was the guy in charge of the Birmingham project, and that was not exactly what you call a success. How did you react to the White Sox not having a first base coach the other day? <laughs> what I liked about it was I see Ian pointing out last night that he came running out of the dugout tucking his pants in. Oh, no, he was looking at film. <laughs> no, he wasn't. He was in the john. Come on. <laughs> Listen, if, if you just say the truth and say, oh, look, he was in the facility, it's okay. It's fine. But, I mean, the Braves broadcast, what they say? We're, we're watching a, 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 not a minor league team. What was it? A, a little league team. That's a pretty big insult, but I thought it was very funny. I think it is symbolic of how long the White Sox have to go <laughs> until they're going to be relevant or until they're going to be winning again. Yeah, really. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, they have some good pieces, like you said. Garrett Crochet, I think, has been outstanding. If, there, if, yes. he, if there's an MVP that we could award in two weeks of the season, it would certainly be him. So I think there are some smaller pieces that over time you could build around, but Unfortunately, as you mentioned, we're going to be talking about years again of consistent losing. I mean, right. do you think that Chris Getz could be the guy to make it better? Because this has been like a, what, almost a 15, 20 year rebuild, essentially. Uh, well, it started in, uh, what was it, uh, in 15 or 16 when they started that teardown. And, you know, I, I thought, honestly, Rick Hahn made some really good moves. They had a pretty good baseball team. You know, the problem is they didn't have a great defensive team, but they could hit the ball and they had some really good pitching. And, you know, they, they made the playoffs. They won 91 games stunningly under Tony La Russa, And then everything caved in, totally caved in. I mean, they were, you know, right up there with the biggest disappointment in baseball, along with the New York Mets, who continue to be a giant disappointment in baseball and the San Diego Padres. The problem is that, you know, those teams could possibly move forward. The White Sox are only going to be taking steps back. So obviously he has to put together a pitching staff. And he's, he's looking at guys like Flexen. And he's looking at, um, at, at Fetty, who had a nice year in Korea. And Soroka, who's trying to build back his career. You know, now they, they, they brought Clevenger back, which is just, I, I, I just do not understand why you did that, other than the fact that you don't think you have enough pitching. The bottom line is it's, you know, if you're a diehard White Sox fan, <clears throat> you're going to have to survive through all of this, this year, next year, the year after that. Who do they have in the minor leagues? There's Colson Montgomery. But they don't even have a good minor league system. The Cubs have a much better minor league system going right now, and they already have a pretty good team to begin with. Yeah, what do you think about the Cubs? I know they started off 0-2. They're now 3-2, and at least as of this taping. Right. I think they're in a good position. Well, obviously, they lost Steele. 
unfortunately, their ace, who probably will not pitch until the first or second week of May. Um, you know, Tyone has still not pitched. And he's really not a number two. They don't have one of those. So they're going to struggle in that department. But their offense is really good, and so is their defense. As long as Christopher Morrell really doesn't play third base. I've, I've said this now, and I'm going to predict he is going to be the, the Cubs' number one offensive player this year. If he gets 550 at-bats, he's going to hit, hit 40 home runs and drive on more than 100 runs. He is an electric, exciting player who's gotten to be a smarter offensive player. And he's only, what, 25 years old. But they've got a really good defensive team, but they still want to give this experiment at third base. And I'm not sure I understand why, because he really can't play third base. He's better off being what Eloy Jimenez should be for the White Sox, and that is a full-time DH. Offensively, they've got the power. Believe me, if you've got Bellinger hitting 25 or more homers and Ian Happ may be hitting 20, and your right fielder, if he's able to play Suzuki for a whole season, can hit 25, and you've got Morel, they, they've got enough offense. It's really going to be when Steele comes back, can Tyone find a little magic again? Because the rest of that staff is young and not tried yet. And, you know, as far as uh, the, the, the youngster they brought up, Brown, uh, I'm going to just throw out that first game. He's going to be with them for the time being. We'll see whether or not he's the type of guy that's going to mature very quickly. Uh, can they win the division? Yes, but it's going to depend on how they hold on without steel. You know, the Brewers are off to a pretty good start. The Reds are off to a decent start. How about the Pirates? Pirates have a <laughs> very exciting team. You know, People don't recall back in 2015 because the Pirates have to continue to rebuild over and over again because they can't keep their players. But remember 2015 when the, the Cubs won the, the, the National League? They, they beat the Pirates. The, the Cubs won 97 games. The Pirates won 98, and the Cardinals won 100. And the Cubs beat them. And then the Pirates right. went out. Right now, the Pirates have some very good young pitching. They've got some pretty good offense. That's a very exciting baseball team. As for the Marlins... Their season's over. <laughs> I think they're 0-7 now. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, they got Tim Anderson down there, so I guess uh, Tim Anderson could not get out of mediocrity. He just goes to a different team, and it happens again and again and again for no, him. No, and Berg Berger's there, too. I he mean, is there, too. He's a terrific player, but they're, they're, they've had tremendous injuries to their pitching staff, and so that, that this has been a real disaster for them. I don't want to call this year a failure if the Cubs don't win the division, but I mean, I would assume they at least need to make the playoffs, right? Based on what they did this offseason, they bring in Craig Council, they spend some money. Yep. You have to think playoffs at minimum should be the expectation. Well, I would think so. And I would think that if you brought it, <clears throat> excuse me, if you brought in Craig Council, you've got to say, okay, if he's this good of a manager in the regular season, he's worth at least four wins. I, I just can't understand how people say, well, the National League Central. The, the team that wins the division could win it with 83 or 84 wins. Sorry, that doesn't happen. It's not going to happen in the American League Central as well. Somebody's going to win at least 88 to 90 games because that's pretty much what always happens. But in that division, it's likely the only way to make the playoffs is to win the division because your wild cards can be coming from the National League West, you know, and uh, in the East, you still have the Phillies as a possibility. Uh, the Mets are off to a lousy start. So I think that the only team that's going to come out of the Central is going to be the team that wins the division. And yes, the, the, listen, the, the Cubs have the ammunition. It's the pitching and whether or not they can hold on during the course of the time that uh, steal us out. Assad was really good yesterday. Let's remember they are playing the Colorado Rockies, who are about as a minor league team as the White Sox are. But listen, these are the teams you got to play. Wait until this weekend. The Dodgers are here. So we're going to see, you know, how that works at the, on the north side of town. George Droppin still here with us on Sports Talk Chicago. Author, tell me a story I don't know. And a 40-plus year sports media veteran. George, quickly, I do want to talk about the Bulls. They clinched a spot in the play-in tournament. We should be well, celebrating, hey, right? Hey, celebrating with what, a glass of milk? <laughs> <laughs> I, what do you think about their season? Their season is basically a hamster in a cage. It's going around and around and around, and it's going to be a disaster. It's really unfortunate because way back, I think it was in the 80s, 
uh, Jerry Reinsdorf declared, I do not want to be the Milwaukee Bucks, who are basically a 500 team. And that's exactly what the Bulls are going to be. Uh, that doesn't matter if they finish ninth or 10th and they win the playoff series against Atlanta, they're going to lose the first round either four games to none or five or four games to one, whatever the case may be. Then you have the offseason. Are they going to re-sign to Mar DeRozan? I think they shouldn't, but they probably will because they need to put fannies in the seats so that they have an exciting competitive team that will be basically 500 next year. What do they have? Okay, DeMar DeRozan's a terrific player. You're stuck with Vucevic. I hate to say that, stuck with Vucevic. Um, Kobe White's really been good. He's kind of been slowed lately, but he's been really good. He's been a revelation for the season. Ayodosumo's playing real well. And, you know, you have a defensive player who, who knows if he's going to be here next year as well. The rest of it, Patrick Williams, a bust. And now you have to figure out, is Zach Levine going to be playing here next year? The answer is likely yes, because I don't see any way that you're going to be able to trade him in the offseason because he's coming off of a of knee surgery and he's got a giant bill that has to be paid. So I just don't see the Bulls going anywhere, but like straight, just straight, 500. That's it. I, I, they're not a championship caliber team. They're not going to be a championship caliber team. And no major free agent's going to come to join them because they know they're just not good enough. And George, a uh, question here before we finish up as well. Um, update us on what you're up to. I know the book uh, that came out late last year. Now that's been going well. What's going on with you? Well, me, I'm playing a lot of tennis. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice too. <laughs> it, it, it is where I'm, you know, I, I play at uh, this place called McFedridge. I started playing there in 1983 and I'm still playing, playing tennis. Um, listen, I am what you would call at age 70, uh, not retired, but unemployed and still looking and still wanting to stay vibrant in the business. But it's, I understand it's not easy. Uh, so I'm still out there. I am the free agent. Okay. But I'm not demanding a multi-year contract. I'm not demanding giant money. I don't have an agent. I should call Scott <laughs> Boros. That might not be a bad idea. Uh, and, and see what I can do. But, but I'm out there. But listen, I'm having a good time. Life is very interesting. It's a lot of fun. Um, so we'll see what happens, John. That's just, uh, it's the nature of life. And, you know, I've gotten to that stage now that, you know, I've been doing this now for 50 years. And I you know, started in 1974. And uh, here we are in 2024. The time has gone really fast. Hey, you've been doing this now for 10 years, haven't you? Yeah, 10 years. How, that's how right. How about that? How about <laughs> that? Time flies. It you started does. you you started when you were four years old. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and now I'm 14. <laughs> yeah, see? It's it's but you know the funny thing is it does go fast. You know, you turn your head and it's like, whoa, really? Seriously? But, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I still have a very positive take that uh, eventually I'll land somewhere. Well, everybody, uh, make sure you check out George's new book, too. Tell me a story I don't know. It was a podcast. It was, a, would say, a very successful podcast. He turned it into a book. You can find it anywhere you get your books, on Amazon as well. Uh, George, always appreciate the time, my friend. Thanks for coming on, and we're looking forward to talking again soon, too. Always my pleasure, John. Thanks. We're going to be right back here at Sports Talk Chicago. Caleb Williams is meeting with the Bears front office and teammates. What's that mean? We'll discuss next. Thank you, George. We'll see you that, soon. That was Appreciate fun. it. Yes, yeah. it was very right, good. You got you to continue your show. <laughs> yes. How do I get a copy of it? Just go to the uh, 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 watch it on YouTube? Yep, it'll be on YouTube, and I'll send you a copy as well. All right, great. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks, we'll George. Bye-bye. Sports Talk Chicago. Here with John Zaglou, back at it. Big shout out to George Oppen for joining us on our first two segments here in today's program. What a great interview. George is a wealth of knowledge. He's been in the business for 40 plus years. He has a new book out and we talked everything. So if you're here for Sports Talk Chicago, if you're here to hear about Cubs, White Sox, Bulls, and Bears, we covered it all in 32 minutes in our first two segments of the program. If you missed it, go ahead and podcast at sportstalkchicago.com or go on YouTube. Find us on YouTube at Sports Talk Chicago. Hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and be a part of the conversation and be a part of us and our STC community. 
Uh, last segment of today's program, shout out to all of our great radio and TV affiliates on the STC Syndication Network, WROK 101.1 Peoria Sports Radio, 98.3 The Life, WKAN 105.5 The Ticket, ACTV, Jet TV, WJOB, and Cities 92.9 Talk FM. All righty. Last segment of today's program, I'm going to split this one up. I want to first talk about uh, Caleb Williams stuff. We, we have some new news on Caleb Williams. But I do want to end talking about the White Sox. Um, we kind of briefly touched on it. This one's been ruminating in Saturday for a little bit. It's going to be a mini rant, a half-segment rant that we're going to get to to end the show and send you guys off um, energetic and electric. We'll put it that way. So Caleb Williams is in town. And Caleb Williams has met with the Bears front office and current players on this team. According to Mark uh, Silby Silverman, Silby, ESPN 1000, Caleb Williams was in town on Tuesday evening and had dinner with Bears brass, including some current players. Uh, this article here from Bears Wire, Brendan Chagru, good friend of this show, and uh, Joey Christopoulos is, uh, it says, quote, during the NFL owners meetings last week, too, the Bears indicated Williams would be coming in sometime this week for his official visit. The twist, however, is that he was meeting with and getting to know current players during the dinner. Apparently, quote from Sylvie, they had him not sit with the Bears executives who were there. He sat and ate with current players on the Bears roster. It's not known which current players were in attendance. Okay. Well, if you thought, I don't know if they're going to draft Caleb Williams, I think this all but seals it, I would hope, unless the Bears are playing the uh, biggest fakeouts in world history. They're going to be taking Caleb Williams. And I like this report. This is not a big deal. This is not necessarily breaking news. But it tells a lot, and it shows a lot, about Caleb Williams and the Bears' willingness, even before they draft him, to get him integrated with this team and to make him a legitimate cog in this organization. They want him to fit in. They want this to work out. And they're doing what they can. And you know what? It's different. It is different than Justin Fields or Mitch Trubisky. It really is. You know, they didn't do this stuff with both those quarterbacks. Now, in those cases, both times they had to trade up. Both times there was some controversy before about what they would do. This is more of a surefire pick and a surefire lock. But still, they're doing their due diligence to let Caleb Williams truly be a part of the team, to introduce himself to his teammates. And as you know, during Pro Day, Keenan Allen even attended out in Los Angeles for Caleb Williams. People were worried when Justin Fields got traded how the chemistry would be. And it's clear that the Bears are doing their best to make sure that chemistry comes back together. They're doing their best to mesh everybody, to have everybody gel, even before we talk about OTAs and training camp and actual gameplay, which I think is smart. Because there are stories out there about Caleb. The media is going after him. There are all these people saying all these different things. At the end of the day, if he and his teammates get along well, if his teammates have his back, if there's trust between them, especially from the offensive line and Caleb and vice versa, this is going to work out for the Bears. And this is going to work out for Caleb and company, especially on offense. That's the way I see it. And that's the most important thing. I think that's what's kind of being done here. They're doing their best to work out any kinks before the pick becomes official. They're working together, trying to find common ground, making sure that everything's okay between both parties. That's great. So this news, again, it's not breaking news. It's not splitting the atom. (laughs) But it's important. It's important to see that this is happening as we're about, what, a couple of weeks away from the draft now? I think we know where the Bears are going to be going. And I like this proactive approach. They're not being reactive. And I give actually Ryan Poles and Kevin Warren a lot of credit. This is going to be their first time together really digging into a draft. This is going to be Poles' first time drafting a quarterback even, too. And this is going to make or break his career for sure in Chicago. It's going to make or break it easily. So I like that he's not following the patterns of Pace, right? Pace got to draft two quarterbacks. He wasn't doing this stuff. Poles is trying to be different. He's being proactive, not reactive. Because if he was being reactive, it'd be, all right, guys, I'm taking him. Get to know him later. No. Hey, guys, I'm thinking about taking him. I want him to mesh with you. I want this to be a good pairing. So let's start the conversations now. Let's start the 
chemistry and the conversations and the talking and the get to know you part now that way we don't have to waste time later and that way you already have familiarity with one another come ota time and come preseason and then come the actual season so i think this is good i think this is really good may not be breaking news but it's a good thing to me i think at least all right been waiting on this one and i'm going to end with this for the last five six minutes want to talk about what happened this week for the White Sox. I'm never afraid to voice my opinion on the team. Never afraid to come out and criticize them when they screw up. Now, as George Oppen said during our interview, this would be a non-story if the truth was discussed. This would be a non-story if, hey, he had to really go to the bathroom. Couldn't hold it, had to go. This is what happened. Lamar Jackson left a game to go to the bathroom, and that's okay. Nobody is saying Lamar Jackson sucks or I hate him or wow, what a moron. Nope. Lamar Jackson had to leave a game to go to the bathroom. If if he that's the truth, if that's what really happened, it's all good. We're fine. Let's move on. Early in the year, you know, trying to get things acclimated. Something happens. We all have issues. We all have emergencies. It's okay. It's fine. We're human beings. We understand. Here's my issue though. That's not what was said. Pedro Grafal said that he was in the dugout reviewing film and had headphones on, so he didn't realize what inning it was or when he was supposed to come out there, even. And even worse, the Braves broadcast, rightfully so, I don't blame them, made fun of it. They made fun of him. They made fun of the White Sox. They called the White Sox a little league team, and that's the bigger point of this whole thing. It's not that he didn't go out there. It's not even that they covered it up and said, oh, he was reviewing film. It's that they really are a Little League team. And this is what we're going to be subjected to for years to come. And this is where we're at with this team. And I already ranted about them last year at the end of this season when they made Chris Getz the GM, which they probably shouldn't have done. Although he's doing okay now with the limited resources he has. This team is a Little League team, and if the A's weren't being as horrendous as they've been, the White Sox would be the bottom feeder of the of the league. There's no question about it. I'm a White Sox guy. I mean, I appreciate their, again, their history, their culture, their legacy. I love Luis Robert. Garrett Crochet's been on fire. I am so wildly impressed with Garrett Crochet. So I like aspects of this team. No question. But this is not Major League Baseball. This is Little League Ball with a couple of superstars. Two. Maybe three, if you want to count anybody else on this team. Yoel Mokata's playing okay. He's making money like a superstar, but he's not a superstar. That's the White Sox in a nutshell. That's where they stand. They screwed up their broadcasting team this past year, even. I mean, they, they went as far to that. Now they're talking about a new stadium. I don't know who's going to go watch their damn games. I'm not going to pay for it. They're horrible. This team is a joke. And the fact that they went to the extent that they did to cover up somebody going to the bathroom during a game, saying he's watching film. I mean, come on. If he's watching film, then why the hell are you guys one and four already? (laughs) I mean, this is going to be another long season. They don't have any weaponry on their team at all. They have nothing. And what happened the other day at first base is, as I said with George, I was joking, but I'm being serious. It's symbolic of them as an organization and of them as a team. It's just symbolic of the direction they're going in. It's symbolic of what they're even all about. I mean, they are just horrendous. The decisions that have been made. Certain players who have stayed, other players who have been cut and gotten rid of, other players who have been re-signed for really no reason other than why not, I guess. And now you got this incident happening first week of the year. I mean, this is so bad. And I feel for White Sox fans who have to endure and deal with this. It's a joke. And I give White Sox fans credit. You guys are very long-suffering and patient. For whatever reason, I don't know, but you're very patient because, 
Had something like this similarly happened to the Bears or happened maybe even to the Cubs, there'd be more of an uproar about it. But instead, we just laugh and say, yep, that's the White Sox. That is not right. That's not what we should be saying about this team. they got to be better, and we have to expect better from them. We have to expect better from them than this. It's going to be a long couple of years. I'm fully aware, and I understand that. But could we at least get somebody out there to coach first base? Could we, could we at least have somebody there to do something, to want to be there? Right? Doesn't seem to be the case. And you're only a week in. I defended Pedro Grifo last year to the end of the end of the season. And I said they shouldn't have fired him. People were calling for him to get fired. They didn't fire him. I thought that was the right move. It's a first year manager. You really had nothing. Your GM gets fired mid season. What are you gonna do? Right? I, I don't blame Grifo. I will say this, though. If these incidents keep happening, Grifol is going to be out. Plain and simple. And I like Grifol. I like his philosophies. I enjoy listening to him speak. I'm one of the few people maybe who feels that way, but it sounds like he has a wealth of baseball knowledge in terms of X's and O's. He knows the game. But this kind of stuff can't be happening. And there's a difference between having a good knowledge of the game and being a leader. As a manager, you're a leader. You also have to have knowledge, but you got to be a leader. You got to have your players buy in. You got to have your bench coaches and people around you buy in. It can't just be, I know a lot about the game. Let's see how it goes. There are many managers over time who've known tons about the game who've been abject failures in baseball. There are some managers who I think are successes who the public deems to be a failure, and they have a lot of knowledge in baseball, like Joe Madden or Tony LaRusso. Uh Uh-oh, I said his name. Whatever. The point is, there are people around the league who have tons of knowledge about the game, but they're not always great managers. And for this incident to occur, and then for the cover-up, I guess, if you want to call it, it's not even a controversy, just tell the truth next time. My point is, this is not good. It is symbolic of what the White Sox are, what they stand for, what they look like this year already. To me, it's only going to get worse, too. I mean, I have no idea what this team's going to look like in four months. Probably not going to be good. I mean, they're one and four. Start the year. So, (laughs) this is not the position they want to be in. And from my heart to yours, White Sox fans, I feel your pain. And I understand why you feel the way you do. I mean, this is horrible. Completely horrible. It's unacceptable. And if it wasn't for the A's acting like a peewee or a t-ball team, this would be being talked about more nationally, not just Chicago. I mean, here in Chicago, when you say the White Sox, everybody just starts laughing and, oh, yeah, they suck, whatever. But now it should be a bigger deal than just a joke. It should be, what the hell's going on over there? Right? Shouldn't just be, oh, yeah, that's the White Sox. No. Shouldn't be business as usual for your first base coach to just not be there during a major league game. It shouldn't just be business as usual for another five years of 90-plus losses. That's not business as usual. That's a problem. They better figure things out over there and quick. They're going to give Chris Katz time, but Rafal's in trouble, I would say, already. And... The team in and of itself, if they don't prove anything or show any results in at least two or three years, back to square one we go, I guess. Something's got to change. And that incident, although small, is a microcosm and a symbol of where this Sox team is today. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Big thank you to George Offman for hanging out with us for two segments. He was amazing. Well, the knowledge... Remember, you can podcast the show, sportstalkchicago.com. Follow us all over at Sports Talk Chicago. Subscribe on YouTube and watch the show live and in segments at Sports Talk Chicago. Big thank you to John Meadows, directing and producing, holding down the fort. My name's John Zaglul. Until next time, and thank you again to our affiliates. So long.